Hi, I'm Kaylee, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Mother Carey's Chickens by Kate Douglas Wiggin. Today I'm wearing my spiffy glasses. Uh, usually I just wear contacts, but today my contacts were all itchy and they were bothering me. So you get to see me in all my nerdy glory. Mother Carey's Chickens is a book that I think I've read uh, three times now. The title is taken from Charles Kingsley's The Water Babies story, which I happen to have right here, along with an edition also of Peter Pan. In The Water Babies by Charles Kingsley, there's sort of a Mother Nature type figure, which is um, Mother Carey. And she has sort of these little messengers, which are Mother Carey's chickens, and the story goes that they are sent out to show good birds the way home. And that is repeated a lot in Mother Carey's Chickens by Kate Douglas Wiggin, um, that sort of the children in the story are going to show the good birds the way home. There are a lot of references to the water babies in Mother Carey's Chickens, so if you haven't read Water Babies, then you might be like, what are they talking about? I mean, the story is self-explanatory, even if you haven't read it, um, but there are some references to it that you could just sort of skip over if you don't know what they're talking about with water babies. The children in Mother Carey's Chickens are very, very attached to their mom, and with good reason. Nancy, the oldest, when she's asked who she loves best, um, she said that first in her affections is her mother, then there's a wide space all around, and next comes father, and next comes a character, sort of like an uncle, the admiral, and then everybody else scattered in, in, in various positions in her, in her love and in her affections. But that's sort of a premise of the whole story is there's Mother Carrie, and then a wide space all around. Nobody else can come close. Most of the story is about how the children are growing up little by little. They're trying to help their mother. Um, they're trying to sort of be good soldiers, you know, and work hard to help the family. And there are a lot of really comical situations they get into. I love really the whole dynamic between the Carey family. They're all full of fun and good spirits and uh, sort of this cheerful bravery, even in the face of poverty or having to move to a new home. And they have so many fun little plays that they do and um, just sort of whistle while you work type of cheerful courage. One of the things I like about them is they've moved around so much because they're a military family. And so they're used to just moving furniture around just to see how the furniture looks, looks in a different place in the room. Any Carrie, from Mother down to Peter, who is the littlest, would spring from his chair at any moment and assist any other Carrie to move a sofa, a piano, a kitchen stove if necessary, with the view of determining if it would add a new zest to life in a different position. Even the simplest things, they find joy in it. And that's what I really love about the Carrie family. One of the things I really did not like about this book um, something that really rankled with me was when the girls uh, leave school before the end of the school term, before the semester is over, uh, because they're moving and so they need to, you know, help their mother to set up the new house. But still, the way that it was treated, it was like, oh, they can miss school because they're girls. And it doesn't matter if girls miss school. As long as the boys don't miss their learning, you know, it just, it made me so mad. There's another thing that was weird. On Thanksgiving Day, the town has a parade of antiques and horribles. I have no idea what that is. That's apparently some sort of tradition that they used to have on Thanksgiving. A parade of antiques and horribles. If anybody knows what that is, please comment down below because I would love to figure out what that was. Um, that just sounds strange. I don't know. That sounds like something that would be more appropriate for Halloween than for Thanksgiving. Weird. I think the theme of this book is best summed up by a quote in uh, one of the chapters. It says, think of your blessings 
and don't be a coward. That's just sort of as a theme that runs through the whole book. Think of your blessings and stay cheerful and don't be a coward. This sort of cheerful bravery um, in meeting your problems with cheerfulness. The writing style in this book is really fantastic. It's so quaint and, and just charming, this sort of old world um, writing style. Sometimes I wish that there were more detail in the stories, uh, more detail about Nancy and Olive's relationship in particular. I really love their friendship, and I just wish we saw more of them interacting together in conversations between the two of them. But that's also very typical of old-fashioned writing. They don't just have a ton, a ton of details, you know, they sort of tell the story in almost a more of a bare manner than we're used to with more modern writing where it's just an, an overload of details. This book is rather preachy, which is very true of most of the children's fiction of the time. A lot of old, well, not just children's fiction, you know, adult fiction. Most of the sort of old-fashioned books are very preachy. It's all about these little moral lessons that they're teaching. But it's so quaint and old-fashioned and charming. I don't even mind the moral lessons, you know? I really love it. This one's sort of like Little Women as well. I mean, the writing style is similar and the, the sort of the home life of this little family and then all of the little moral lessons that they learn, all of that is very similar to Little Women in style. <laughs> One of my favorite comical situations they get into is when Gilbert takes the wrong train and somehow I can just see it in my mind. The horrible look of surprise on his face. The wrong train? How can I be on the wrong train? That was just such a comical situation in my mind. I, I just laughed my head off when I was reading that. Another funny one is the continuing saga of You Dirty Boy which is, is that horrible figurine that keeps popping up and then they break it and it's no good, it keeps coming back. The curse of the carries, that stupid figurine that they hate so much, that just cracked me up that it kept coming back over and over. Oh, another funny thing about Mr. Popham is when he's telling the story about uh, when he was a teacher and all of the boys in the school were too violent and so they sent him in to get them in line and the kids didn't even learn anything probably but at least the school was kept in line. <laughs> that whole story was so hilarious. In the storyline there were some bits that were sort of unbelievable like oh okay the ant conveniently dies and leaves them a bunch of money. Gosh isn't that lucky? You know yeah, I guess all that coming a million miles away. But there, was, there were some things that were really left, left unresolved. Like, I kept thinking that Mrs. Carey was going to marry the Admiral at the end, and then that never happened. So why was the Admiral even there? What purpose did he serve? I don't know. Uh, another thing in the end was we didn't really see Gilbert go to college. I mean, it didn't even mention it. Of course, now he has all this money, so obviously he's going to go off to college. All their problems are solved. Uh, but then we didn't see that. So it's kind of like, hey... There's some stuff missing here. Where's the rest of it? And then I was wondering about the figurine, you dirty boy. Um, well, did they break it again? Now that the ant's dead, they don't have to keep it. Did they keep it out of her, you know, her memory? Or did they give it away? I mean, did they still keep it? Because it's like, oh, you hated that thing all these years, and now the ant is dead. You can get rid of it. What did they do? We will never know. <sighs> One of the things that's difficult about this book is all those moral lessons. Everybody's trying to improve everybody else, which is good, but it seems like Mrs. Carey is just this perfect, perfect angel of a person. Like, she might as well be an alien from another world because there is nothing else in this world to compare with her glory and majesty and just the perfect perfectness of her perfect self. And you would think that that would be really horrid to read about, like she would just be the most uninteresting character in the world when everybody loves her. She's so charming and she's so beautiful. But actually, somehow it's not. You'd think that would get on my nerves. Like thinking about it after I've read the book, I think, yeah, what's up with Mrs. Carey? She was just so perfect. She couldn't have even one flaw, come on, you know? But then at the time, 
I just loved her. I loved reading about Mrs. Carey, and I was like, oh, man, she's so, she's so great, and she's so awesome, and oh, if I knew her, I would just hug her, and I would just ask her to be my very favorite aunt. You know, she doesn't get on your nerves somehow. I don't know why that is. I mean, like, if you analyze the character, she ought to be really boring and like, oh, please, she's so perfect. You know, she ought to get on your nerves, but she doesn't. And I cannot figure out why that is. She doesn't get on my nerves. I love her. I love that character. I wish there were thousands more books about her. I would read them all. She's lovely. Same thing with Nancy. Nancy starts out with some flaws, but not very serious ones, which she overcomes pretty quickly and pretty soon in the book. And then after that, she's perfect Nancy, and she's graceful, and she's charming, and everyone flocks to her. She's so attractive. But I love Nancy. She's so spunky. I just, I would be her best friend. Analyzing the character, I know that she ought to annoy me. But somehow she just doesn't. She's just so quirky and fun. I just love her. Julia's character seems to me to be sort of erratic. We definitely see a lot of character development with her in the beginning. She's not helpful. She's not particularly kind. She's boring. She thinks she's perfect, but everybody just can't stand her because she's so nitpicky. And she's sort of a tattletale and a prig. And um, it's one of those goody two-shoes that... It's just self-righteous and holier than thou just for the sake of it, without any of the good qualities of being holy. And then we do see a lot of character development for her. She sort of develops a, f a sense of humor, finally. And she realizes that just because you're following the rules doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing good. However, there's sort of a lot of back and forth. It's like she'll she'll do something nice and then she'll be back to her old, you know, rule nitpicky self. And then she'll do something good and she'll she'll sort of show a vulnerable side to the family. She'll go back to holding everybody at arm's length. Which is actually very true of real life. When people change, they don't change like in books where they're like, Aha! I have had an epiphany and now I am a brand new person. You know, there's this back and forth. You're learning a new behavior, and you're learning to think a new way, and that's exactly the way Julia does. So Julia's uh, character development really is very true to life. It's very interesting to see her change as a person little by little, and she has setbacks, and then she, she moves forward. So there's a lot of uh, truth to the way that her character changes. Gilbert really got on my nerves through almost the entire book, it isn't really until almost the end that we see that he's really putting his best foot forward and changing as a character. Most of the time he's really selfish. There's a quote where he got his shoulder out of joint one time, and he was younger then, but he says, I could have borne it so much better if it had happened to someone else. So if someone else had had their shoulder out of joint, I could have borne it much better. It's like, wow, you would really wish that on somebody else so that you wouldn't have to be in pain? What's wrong with you? And, of course, Mother Carrie sees that he has this selfish tendency, and she tries to teach him, you know, there's a lot of these little moral lessons about being unselfish and, uh, you know, being the man of the house because he's the oldest. And in the end, we finally do see that he's coming into his own and he's becoming more sympathetic to others and more industrious and not as proud either and he does what is necessary to help the family so in the end I do like Gilbert a lot better but for most of the book he just really gets on my nerves <laughs> one of the characters that was really under undeveloped was Cyril Lord I never really understood you know why was it that Nancy didn't like him I mean she was nice to him anyway but I liked him okay I mean he was he was shy and kind of strange maybe but can you blame him um just because he's not all vibrant and charming like all of the Carries are, that doesn't mean that he's unlikable. We just didn't really get to see very much of him. Peter is one of the characters that is just so cute and adorable, but he's he has that potential, like he could grow up to just be a complete brat, but then they sort of narrowly avoid him actually being a spoiled brat. But he's just so adorable, everybody just wants to do everything for him. And then in that way, he really does develop into a charming little boy. He's just a sweet little character. 
I like how there's a quote that talks about that Peter has the largest kissing acquaintance of anyone in their town. That everybody that sees him, they just want to give him a kiss and cuddle with him. So, to sum up, in spite of some of the flaws of the storytelling or the characters, I still enjoyed it immensely. Uh, sitting down and analyzing the book, I can say, these are the flaws, and this character was no good, and this writing style, blah, 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 and I didn't like this. But somehow, when I was reading it, I wasn't thinking about that. I was just enjoying it. I love the story. I love the characters. This is such a cool book. This is so much fun. I couldn't put it down. It was interesting. It was, it was engaging. I just love it. I enjoyed it probably even more than I did the first time that I read it. Mad Dog, Rebecca, and I read this book together and we're doing our reviews together, so definitely go and check out her channel, uh, check out her review, and I will include a link to that below. And if you want to see some illustrations from this edition of the book, you can check out the book trailer that I made with illustrations from this 1930s um, Riverside Bookshelf edition. And I will put a link to that below as well. If you've read this book, please comment below. Thanks so much for watching, and keep reading!